Hi everyone. Hey everybody, Darren well, here. Brandon, and welcome to the White Hatter YouTube show. Uh, we've got some interesting things to talk about, and uh, let's a little different. We used to go live, right? But now we're kind of doing these uh, the recording now, right? Just yeah. To kind of move with the times and what's going on with COVID and stuff. So, but the uh, format is basically the same. We're going to be talking about what has happened the week before that we think uh, people who are watching should know. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty. Let's cool. get into it. Yeah, let's get um, into it. We are going to get some updates. Oh, here we go. Updates. I love updates. What's new? <laughs> uh, for all of you, uh, for those of you who don't know, we do have our app. It is up. It is live. So please. And it's free, right? It's free on both the Google Store and the Apple Store. And what's really important with this is that uh, under the resources page for uh, students in Canada and the United States, we have over 25 different resources that students can reach out to for free, right? To talk about everything from anxiety issues to self-harm, suicidal ideations, eating disorders just a whole wealth of um, helping apps where with a touch of a button you can connect with somebody to talk because we know that talking makes it better and today's COVID-19 world where we're all kind of getting cabin fever now maybe there are some people that need to talk to people and this is a great way to do it and you can download it free on your device yeah, yeah. uh cool. we have a new blog out that we yeah, came out we this do. week yeah this was a re really interesting blog right where we asked students about uh, how their experience have been over the past couple of weeks of using online learning tools that teachers are using because you know we're, we're hearing a lot of stuff from teachers about what they're doing but we didn't hear a lot from students and so that's what this article was all about to ask students and there was some really good insight into there you know one of the biggest ones I took from it Brandon was uh, that the the teens are really giving what they call student buys to the teachers because they're saying you know what this is a new online learning world for all of us and we expect teachers are going to make mistakes they shouldn't think that they need to be perfect so why don't we learn this together plus all kinds of really other good ideas that they can find on that where can they find that article uh it's on our blog yeah. on the website whyhatter.ca yeah check it out pretty good it was really kind of cool and thank you to all the teens who participated in that uh that that article that we wrote yeah for sure uh we did our thankful thursday ah. with uh you posted it the yeah. other day leonie smith Leone is from Australia, Vegemite, Crocodile Dundee, right, kind of thing. So she's a uh, social media advocate, uh, expert down the U.S. where she, much like us, she uh, teaches in schools and had a really good interview with her about what's going on in her country now with COVID and what she's doing as a social media expert down there. So check it out. It's on our YouTube channel. Uh, it's there for everybody to view. It's free. It doesn't cost you anything. So check out what Leone had to say. It was a really good interview. Yeah. Really good interview. Uh, let's go to some news topics. Oh, do, 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 do. In the news in the news uh linksys announced that uh, some of its customers so some of the routers uh people will log into users accounts mm. with uh by assume guessing passwords by finding passwords that were previously breached uh using those passwords so people don't change their passwords when you say linksys what do you mean like i know what you mean but there may be some yeah like i said it's a router so it's, so it's a company name of a it's a it's a vendor's name to a router right like a linksys router yes yeah and so what's going on with this one? Uh, so basically, uh, some hackers found some user passwords, probably because they were guessing emails and usernames uh -huh. and passwords, because they found it elsewhere that was breached. Yeah. Uh, and so Linksys uh, basically forced users to mandatory change a password. Is it is it hard for people to change a password on their router, Brandon? So this was on the user account so the okay. links is smart wi-fi system okay not the not the router itself it was okay. through the login right. web portal okay. um and what basically these attackers were looking at doing is redirecting people's search traffic to mm. uh compromised domains okay. uh specifically related around the covid uh searches uh so sending people to malicious sites oh. which could lead to malicious downloads so what do you recommend uh, well, Linksys uh, forced you, if you had an email from Linksys about changing your password, uh, it's probably legitimate. So make sure you log into your account and change your password if you are affected. We uh, we kind of make a recommendation to everybody that you should be thinking about changing your passwords every six months or so. Should they be doing this on their routers as well and software? Like, Well, it's not the router itself. Right, so this right, is right, the right. user yeah. account. Okay. Um, and uh, generally, as long as your passwords are, are different, you should be fine. Right. And the passwords, again, should be what? How, how long and contain what to make sure? Um, most companies require eight characters minimum with a, with a uppercase, lowercase number and symbol. Yeah. That's the standard minimum. Yeah. And you don't want to be using something like elephant or zebra or something like that. They're too easy to have programs used in line dictionaries, yeah. right? Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Uh, FTC reported this oh, week wow. uh, about 13 million people have reported uh, scams related to COVID-19. Uh, <laughs> not surprising that we're seeing 
increase in cybercrime? You know, what's interesting on this one, I just read an article from the FBI in the United States. They said over the past four weeks, they've seen online crime quadruple quadruple down the U.S. because of COVID. What are some of the things you're seeing with regards to this you know, online crime that's taking place? Uh, we're seeing things like malicious apps, uh, scams, fraud. Uh, not so much direct hacking like breaking code. It's more so human manipulation uh, where attackers are manipulating people in these crazy times. Yeah. People are uncertain and hackers are latching onto that and using that to scam people. Yeah, and I've, also, I've actually I've been following a lot of police departments across North America and Europe and they're actually finding that the number of calls to police specific to young people being groomed online for sexually inappropriate behavior has gone up uh, uh, dramatically in some areas as well. So these are, again, we're all homebound right now. We're all on, on the computers, right, using the internet and stuff. So where people hang out, there will be those who want to prey upon those people for crime, whatever that crime is. So again, it's always important to understand that when you're online doing what it is you're doing, look at reputable places and don't click on links that are being sent to you from people you don't know. Go to the source, right? Yeah. Yeah, go to the source. Interesting, story. Uh, someone uh, created kind of funny, uh, an AI system uh, that kind of replicates themselves, and they used it as their sort of character, their avatar, their their image uh, in Zoom uh, meetings. So, so they're using artificial intelligence to basically make what I like to call a meat puppet then of themselves in front of the basically. camera to make it looks like they're there paying attention, partaking. When yeah. in fact they're not, they're now, probably walking the dog or the, something. The video is not that. S seamless. I mean, it is, it's pretty obvious that it is a, a human uh, AI. Uh, uh, yeah, basically. <laughs> um, so, but we're, it's interesting seeing these kind of trends happening online. We yeah. see students, for example, mimicking or pre doing pre records and yeah. looping things. Yeah. Or uh, it, it's interesting to see how people are playing with uh, video conferencing to make it look like they're paying attention when in fact they're not. I actually saw one adult who uh, recorded themselves in front of their iPhone, right? Just kind of doing this, looking like they're paying attention. Every so often they look off to the side like a normal person do when you're doing like Zooming or video conferencing. And then what they did was they put it on a holder and then they put they put it in such a way so that it was right in front of the webcam on their phone. So and they were in bed sleeping as it looked like they were doing the business meeting. I mean, it's, you know, what's kind of cool is out of this COVID-19 thing that's going on, there's some interesting ingenuity going on too, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, kind of interesting. Yeah, this one kind of made me laugh. All I could think is meat puppet. Yeah. Right? Meat puppet. Right? So, well, interesting. Uh, mm. Kind of a silent feature, pun intended, that was released by uh, Facebook. Oh. Uh, a quiet mode for their mobile platforms. Basically, it's part of their kind of COVID response and more people being at home, more people being online, on Facebook. Uh, some people might want a little break. So instead of actually disabling your account, uh, there's a feature built into the mobile versions of Facebook where you can set up a quiet mode. We set a time parameter and it will mm. basically stop most but not all Facebook notifications uh, from coming through so you can uh, just, you know, continue on with your day or take mm. time to yourself without being consumed by uh, Facebook. And you can obviously set a time frame for five hours and you can, you know, revert that. Mm -hmm. there's, there's extra steps to do that mm. uh, to kind of discourage people from, you know, breaking their quiet mode time. Yeah, you know what? Um we use Facebook as a company and we understand what it does. And do but usually Facebook doesn't do something unless there's an advantage to them. Have you kind of figured out if there's any kind of an advantage to Facebook for doing this? Or are they doing it because it's the right thing to do, which is sometimes hard to believe uh, that Facebook maybe, would do something? Maybe. I think it's, I think it was part of their kind of COVID response uh, strategy and announcement. Yeah. Um, so maybe they're doing it for the right thing to do. I don't see any, you know, financial advantage for Facebook for doing this. Well, let's, let's, let's face it. Get it? Face it from Facebook. Yeah. Let's, let's face it. I mean, all these companies right now are under heavy scrutiny by government over privacy and security issues, right? And, you know, by doing something like this from a PR standpoint, it does work for them. I, you know, TikTok this week released the fact that they're not going to allow anybody under the age of 16 now on their platform to use direct messaging, right? They're messaging on TikTok. But my answer to whatever. that is, exactly. Why whatever? I want to hear what you think about that. What do you think about that? Why did you say whatever? Sign up and make your age 16. <laughs> exactly. I mean, that's exactly what people will do, right? Is they'll create a fake account, sign up as they're 16 or 17 when they're in fact 11 and because there's no age verification going on there but again well, there's the age 13 yeah but there was that minimum but again if i'm 11 though i could 13. still so i can make myself 13. Now you just make it 16. exactly and you know 
I think the only reason they did that is because, again, they're under heavy scrutiny right now over what's going on on TikTok, that they want to kind of put their best foot forward. Because I do think that once COVID passes, and it will pass, we'll get over it. It, it will, We'll never return back to reality. It's going to be a new reality, whatever that's going to be. I do think that there's going to be a reckoning <laughs> for some yeah. of these social media platforms uh, about what they're doing or what they haven't done during this COVID-19 pandemic, for sure. So interesting. I mean, it's kind of a... Co- Good idea. I was just trying to figure out if there's something there that Facebook is gaming to their advantage for doing this. Not that I can see. Yeah, maybe, maybe those who are watching might see something and maybe you can send us a message and we'll talk about it next show. Uh, <laughs> interesting story from uh, Talos. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Talos. Security. Who's, who's Talos? Uh, they're, uh, they're a company that does information security, so oh, they do so infrastructure yeah. work and IT support from okay, gotcha. a security perspective. So what are they fine? They have a research team, and their research team decided, hey, can we clone fingerprints and use it to uh, log into fingerprint uh, security systems? Really? And uh, based on the quote and their testing, uh, on average, they achieved about an 80% success rate. Uh, Have you seen the movie uh, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Total Recall? Yes. They kind of did it in Total Recall. So, really? I mean, to, I mean... Caveat, I mean, uh, although they had a good success rate, uh, it took a lot of time, yeah. effort, and they had full access to the fingerprints and to the device. So so it's it's not as if the average hacker is going to be able to do something like this, right? No, no. No, it takes a lot of time and money. I mean, if if you're working if you're working in the intelligence field or yeah, you're, like or corporate you're... corporate um, espionage or maybe if you're a um, uh, a country, a, yeah, you know, a country, something like that. So, I mean, for the average home user, not a big deal. Uh, but I mean, it's how same. are they getting the prints? Uh, so they, they use three collection methods. So they use either a uh, like from like a glass, like you know, like you know, in what is it, uh, Mission Impossible kind of thing, yeah, yeah, right? Like yeah, that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, or <laughs> Mission Impossible, of course, you would think of that, yeah. right? <laughs> or it was um, through like a third party, being it. Um, like a fingerprint swatch. That oh, yeah, get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or it would be through a yeah. uh, fingerprint scanner. Oh, really? Well, here's the, so the, so the question. So let's say some countries have, you, you, you enter to a country, you travel to internationally, you go into a country, some countries have fingerprint scanners. Oh, that's true. Never thought about that. So what they did, they, they got a scanner and they got fingerprints and then they just 3D printed basically a finger. You know, it kind of reminds me of my policing days where we had Strike Force, and their their job was to collect DNA, what's called cast off DNA, yeah. which under the court under the criminal courts here in Canada Supreme Court, if somebody casts off something like used bubble gum or whatever, it's no longer private, right? Mm-hmm. So um, uh, members of the strike force, if they had an identified target that they were working on, say for a high level crime, let's say a homicide or something like that, and they had DNA at at the crime site, and now they have a potential suspect, but they don't have a suspect's DNA. They would follow them around until they see them toss something, or go into a, you know, into a coffee shop, grab a coffee, drink a coffee, throw the coffee cup in the garbage. They would collect the coffee cup because the coffee cup would have residual DNA on there to help get a DNA. Kind of reminds me of that, but they're kind of doing this for fingerprints, right? Fingerprints, yeah. <laughs> kind of cool. Again, but again, it took a lot, a lot of time, money. They had a 3D printer. There was trial and error. Uh, we should get one. I want to make your fingerprint. Let's, we should try that. They had really advanced 3D printers. We're good. You're good at what you do. Okay, you whatever. Know, whatever. Uh, funny. <laughs> Can you imagine what it would look like? It looked like... Um, oh. We have a monitor. Uh, Ooh, this so, one concerns me. Interesting. So their researchers uh, were doing their usual audits online, seeing what they could find. Mm-hmm. And they came across, um, well, some people's leaked uh, digital wallets. Uh, King Ring is an app that stores, you can store your credit card information, your membership cards, like Ooh. the different things you carry in your wallet. Is it like Apple Wallet? Basically, it's the same kind of thing. Okay. Uh, however, uh, researchers determined that the servers, the Amazon servers that this company used Uh-oh. to store all their users' card information, pictures, yeah, yeah, yeah. was an unsecure database. Uh, <laughs> basically, it was about any, so, so essentially what, what they said was, Anybody with a web browser could have viewed over 44 million images uploaded by Keyring users. Private data included things like government IDs, uh, retail club memberships, oh loyalty God. cards, NRA memberships, gift cards, credit cards, including C- CVV numbers if the picture of the back was taken as well, oh. medical insurance cards, and many more. Uh, some retail companies, uh, people had entered in the full names, email addresses, membership IDs, birth dates, and location. So... Wow. 
That's uh, so. Were they able to prove that there was a breach, or did they just say they identified the breach and then I brought it to the attention of this company, kind of like a zero day X? Yeah. Right? So they, it's there's no known bad actor who found this. I mean, that being said, I mean it, the, the server has been open for for a while, so uh. someone could have come across it. But at least this company saw it, they reported it, and now it's supposedly fixed. So I, again, I think for people who are watching that, and I think it's really important that you're always watching all the accounts that you're using, looking for any mm -hmm. kind of suspicious behavior. Yep. And if you see it, report it to your financial institution or whoever you got your card or steering your, your card with, whatever it is, like it's maybe it's a, a Costco card or something like that that you put in there and it was, it was compromised. And then if you see suspicious activity, report it and change your passwords and stuff, right? Yeah, well, I mean, if you change your password on this one, it matters because it's all public. That's you can change your password on these. So for me, I mean, these are pe so the people who use this app, they take their card information and they upload it online. Uh, now, I don't know if people actually would realize, I don't know how many users realize that their cards, their data was being uploaded to a server online. But that wouldn't, I guess that I mean, makes sense to me, It would right? be more sense if you use an app, uh, like a card management app, that actually stores your cards locally on your phone and doesn't upload it to the cloud. Do you know, is that what Apple Wallet does? Do you know if that's what Apple, Apple Wallet is connected to iCloud. So if you connect to your iCloud, it's then saved to your iCloud and shared to your devices. If you don't enable the iCloud version, then it's saved locally. Uh, but again, uh, you have the option to save it locally or not. Yeah. I so will. I would recommend probably saving it locally. Yeah, unless you're sharing it with between devices. But again, if this is my primary device, why would I want to download that information onto my laptop if I have this with me? Like I, I, I like what you just said. Like. If you're going to use something like Apple Wallet, rather than sharing it to the cloud for like, just keep it on your device, yeah. right? And it'll be fairly well encrypted on my device. Yeah. Wow. Assuming your device has a password. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Some people don't. <laughs> yeah. Some people some don't. People, or even if it does, it's like, <laughs> oh my God, your mother. I'm I'm sitting in my chair, sleeping in my sleepy chair, right? And uh, mom needed to get into my phone, and she couldn't get into it. And it's when I had the thumbprint one, like mm -hmm. this is a new phone. Well, she lifted my hand while I was sleeping and put my thumb on my thumb reader and she got in my phone that way, right? Kind of thing. It's like a human hack, right? Yeah, it was basically. a human hack. That's what she did to me. Oh, oh, you know what? The other thing that uh, law enforcement is now doing as well is if they come across, heaven forbid, a, a dead body and they have no um, kind of identification other than a phone on them and that phone has a um, thumb reader, they can take the thumb and put it in, and then get in the mm -hmm. phone and potentially find out who the person is. So those kind of issues, right? So, But again, I think that's why it's so important that those of us who own phones Make sure you put passwords on them, right? Because yes. these things have a ton of personal information on them, yes. right? So, uh, interesting story. A hacker leaks. So this kids. Is, so this mm -hmm. is uh, a, a children's game, and mm -hmm. 23 million usernames and passwords were leaked by a malicious actor. <laughs> Uh, this is a good reason why, we, even when we teach grade four or five students internet safety, we talk about password management and having different passwords. So my question to you, if it's just the kids, then what's the big deal? That's my question. Well, I think I mean, you have an answer to that. The big deal is, uh, let's say kids use a password. Well, yeah. let's use password one, two, three, yeah. pretend. Uh, and they use it for this account. Yeah. And now they're a little older. Uh, humans tend to reuse the same passwords, yeah, even they passwords do. they've used when they were kids. And what we're seeing a lot happening is when it comes to simple one-time sign-on games, we create an account for maybe a couple months because you're a kid. Yeah. Well, because those free games aren't necessarily super secure, yeah. uh, sometimes they're targeted for hackers because let's say a good example, Neopets dating myself right long time ago. Uh, I remember you playing that actually. So Neopets, so that service was breached yeah. a while ago yeah. and let's say i still use one of those a password that had neopets right and now it's publicly available so right. it's easier to guess my password to my account so um just to emphasize that this week we helped uh, uh an adult who connected with us because one of her platforms had been breached and it turned out she was using the same password on eight different platforms and this is exactly why that happens yeah yeah, good point. I mean, it, and again, you know, a lot of us, we don't think about teaching young people, you know, grade four or fives are going to be using this, hopefully with parents overwatch going on. We don't think about ensuring that they too are protecting their digital dossiers, because like it or not, companies like this, because this is a free game, as the kids are playing it, they're creating digital dossiers on the kids who are playing too, right? So we should be protecting yeah. all that stuff. So yeah, good point. Wow, two, 23 million. I know, right? 
Uh... Huh. Surprise, surprise. We kind of talked about this a little bit earlier. Seems like every day, every week, we do a, a show online mm -hmm. talking about the internet, uh, given yeah. current times. Uh, there's always there's been an increase over the last two months of Android and iOS apps relating to coronavirus that are actually filled with spyware, adware, or other malware. Do you, you know, the latest one, it's not really the latest, it's what's old is new again. Remember last year we spoke about this email that was going around saying that I put this piece of malicious software onto your computer and I've now captured you on your webcam watching porn and doing things yeah. and, and mm -hmm. then if you don't put $500 in my Bitcoin account, well guess what? As a result of the COVID-19, it has resurfaced again. This week, we've helped over six uh, people, uh, probably 50-50 teens and adults who've been hit with this thing again. So there's no doubt that as a result of this pandemic and more of us being online, like the FBI report out that I said earlier, they've seen a quadruple in the number of online crimes being committed. So, And a lot of them, it's because you're being sent something. I mean, this week alone, I think we received at least four or five emails where they look pretty legit, but when you look a little deeper, they're not, <laughs> yeah. and they all have links on them, right? And as soon as you click on that link, boom, you're done, right? So don't be clicking on anything that anybody's sending you without knowing who that sender is. And even then be somewhat careful because how do you know that a friend that is you're really good friends with, they didn't get hit, and then when all of a sudden they send you something and you click on it, boof, now you're infected yep. too, right? What are some ideas other than, um, does some of the anti-malware uh, help prevent against some of these uh, phishing attacks that are, are clickbait uh, associated? From the apps? Yeah. So let's say, or let's say somebody sends me a, a message and it has a link on it to go to ABC and that link is infected. Will my anti-malware pick that up before I click on the link, say in an email or? Yeah, uh, it depends if it's through, if it's through email. Uh, yeah, potentially. If it's on your mobile platform, unlikely, because you probably don't have anti-malware on that platform. Right. Uh, if it's uh, through a Facebook message, for example, no, it won't, because Facebook Messages is its own independent app. Yeah. Um, so it's really the app providers uh, to really filter and manage. I mean, Google mentioned, and I saw a, a, a report this week, Google filters ton, like boatloads. Yeah, Apple does of, too. Of, of, of spam and false messages to their users. Just just on, just on as a side note, because you brought up Google and I brought up Apple, what are your thoughts right now on how those two companies are working together now to track COVID-19 right now as a part of the um, health, public health strategy to deal with the COVID-19? Like I, I've been reading a lot of articles, I'm sure you have as well, about how they're gonna be collecting all this information. You have to voluntarily download it onto your phone. What are some of your thoughts about that, specific to you know privacy and all those things? Um, Privacy-wise, yeah, I'm like, not too for. I'm not that for it. Yeah. Uh, and I think many privacy advocates I've seen online talking about how, especially when it comes to like government surveillance, because again, some agencies are looking at using uh, your cell phone tracking number, like your cell phone number, which yeah. can be tracked yeah. uh, because that's all managed at like government level. Yeah, yeah. Uh, using that number to follow people around. Yeah, because I, you know, the one article I read, it, they said that it, this Apple's almost like a beacon, right? Like you go yes. into malls with the beacons and they track you. And there's some companies uh, we put on our Twitter handle that just as COVID was breaking during the spring break, there's this company in the United States that could see um, cell phones on the beaches in Florida. Mm -hmm. And as, uh, as spring break broke up and the, all the teens and young adults were returning back home, you could see all these phones returning back to their places. And a lot of these places is where those hot spots all of a sudden yeah. started to appear. I mean, the data was anonymized. In other words, they didn't know, or apparently they didn't know the who, yeah. right? But again, there are some privacy issues there and it's voluntary in yeah. nature and stuff. So I, I'm with you, I, like, I, I feel uncomfortable about allowing big companies. Now, they both said that they promised they're not going to do anything with that, but if we had a nickel for every time we've heard them say well, that, All right? it takes is three anonymous pieces of information about you to then determine who you are. Really? Yeah, that's, that, that's the industry standard. Basically, oh. if they know your location, and then they know the... So, basically, if, if all your data is anonymous, like, yep. oh, but if you can piece together all the random oh. anonymous data, you can kind of build a profile. For example, sure, uh, someone's tracking your phone, GPS, mm -hmm. they don't know who it is because it's randomized, but you find out the pattern of a person's movement is at this location, this house, now you know a house location. Now you have, now you have a, a home address, now you have potentially a home phone number, <laughs> now you have potentially a Google satellite view, which then has maybe a license plate. Or and where the President of the United States may be located, because remember that company that did that to one of the Secret Service agencies that is on, uh, did you read that yes. article? <laughs> was, is on, uh, on track 
Trump's protection detail and this one agency was able to find out the guy's cell phone and they were able to track him and fairly well identified where the president was at any time. So yeah, I'm a little hesitant about, I, I understand why they're doing it to try and help what's going on. But again, I just, I think with convenience comes vulnerability. And I think we have to be very careful during this COVID thing that's going on that we're not giving up too much of our privacy surrounding some yep. of these issues, right? But this is an interesting one for sure. And that people need to be aware of over the in increased online crime. Yep. Another good example is uh, I follow a lot of police departments across Canada, the United States and into Europe. And they've said they've seen somewhat of a spike now on online child luring taking mm. place as a result of that. Because why more kids are online, especially the younger ones and wherever kids are, there'll be those who prey upon them for sure. So the, again, things to, to be thinking about. Awesome. Yeah. And that's it. Wow. Quick show. Yeah. Quick oh, show. Good format. I mean, We're going to be developing this format. Yeah, for sure. I, th I think we. it was like quick and dirty, as I yeah. like to call it, right? Like boom, 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 boom. I think uh, some interesting things that are going on. I really look forward to uh, next week's uh, show for sure. And other things to be aware of. What else are we been thinking about doing as a company? Like we've been doing like thinkable Thursdays, right? Yeah, those are pretty set now in stone. I think we're going to keep with yep. that. And then obviously we're going to do this as pre-record. Uh, and then we might be doing some other things throughout the week. We're looking at webinars as well. Yeah. Uh, a lot of things happening with us here in the studio, uh, given I mean, the times. Credit where credit's due. I mean, two years ago, you're the one who identified that virtual as the way to go. And this is how this virtual studio came about was because of you. So, I mean, we, we've been doing it for about two years now. So we've got a pretty good idea. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I think we're going to be able to make a quick pivot. We've already started mm -hmm. doing that as well. So yeah, I'm looking cool. forward to some of the challenges and some of the, some of the ideas that we have. Awesome. Yeah, for sure. So on behalf of myself, I'm Darren. Brandon and the White Hatter team. Bye, everyone. See ya. Bye.